Okay. So we have set our backstory and our policy options. And let's move on to the next step. First thing I'm going to do is uh, just pull the volume back a little. Now let's get into it. Yeah. Thank you. Resume. So our first priority will be having a look at the geopolitical layout of our country. And remember we haven't taken any turns yet. This is all just first up. Now what have we got? Lesbia to the south, Republic of Valen to the southwest, Romberg to the north, Agnolia, don't need that, okay. to the northeast and across the water, Valgsland. Now I'm assuming that each of these little colours here with the dotted lines are separate counties or states within our nation and that these separately coloured lines indicate the places where other states are. Can't zoom out any further I don't think. Journal, Codex, don't need that. Review, political overview, notes, settings. These are all the standard things, aren't they? Yep, yeah, okay. So, um, first obvious thing that comes to mind looking at this from a geopolitical perspective is that we're built around a bay. So, this area here, the Markian Sea, from an ocean defence perspective, I'm assuming we own this island here, Dudu Island. So, that basically gives us complete control of all of this area here because we can use anti-access area denial technologies like anti-ship cruise missiles. Uh, no, what year is it? 1929. We can use coastal batteries to fire on any ships that come close to the coast. Uh, I would recommend building anti-ship coastal batteries all along these coastlines rather than, because here's the thing, we could build a navy instead, however when we are bordering one, two, three, four other states um, with land borders we really ought to put our resources into land forces rather than naval forces so we're going to build a minimal minimum um, credible defense network along the coastlines especially this area here right we need to lock off all of this and I'm not really sure what the scale is here that's the other question what have we got 100 kilometers per cube Oh, okay, so this is a pretty decent sized country actually. Two, three, four, five, five hundred 500 kilometers wide. And two, are these double height and single width? They are, aren't they? 200, yeah, and 400, maybe 500 tall. So a decent sized country. All right. So generally speaking, I think we'll uh, be able to, moving into diplomacy, I think we'll be able to pull off a non-aggression pact with Valgsland. They don't appear to have any neighbours, although we don't know what's going on with the other side of them, so they could credibly build some variety of uh, naval force to threaten us. Agnolia owns this island here, Helgeport. So this is very reminiscent of the Baltic Sea, 
which Sweden owns that island that essentially is in the center of the Baltic Sea and because of that they're capable of denying shipping um, to well to uh, mostly to uh, Russian ships coming out of what's that uh, city called it's embarrassing I don't know the answer to that question not Sevastopol that's the one way down to the south uh, Stalingrad? Is that the one that's right near that little strip of water that pokes out into the Baltic? Well, anyway, you know the one that I mean. And aside from that, moving on to the geopolitics of our land, our major priority is that we lack strategic depth. Right, we have this great big long land border here with Lesbia. Okay. Some of it is blocked off with uh, a defensive river here. So we could build credible defensive zones here. And this river here, still operational. But they could easily drive our armoured battalion into this town. That would be a real problem for us. Because their forces have a distance of attack much shorter than the distance of manoeuvre required for us to respond credibly. And especially if they pushed here and made a great big pocket like this up to the sea, that would divide us in half and that would be a real headache. Now we have a very small border here with Valen and I think that Valen unlikely to push here. Notice they have uh, these defensive formations with Lesbia here. You can see where Lesbia has created a bulge during the last war when the peace treaty was signed to make this gap here. So it's unlikely that this gap will move back and forth unless there's like a critical failure or a major win in the battles or loss as well I suppose. Yeah, we don't really know what the relationship is here because we can only see this much so gathering extra intel will definitely be a major uh, priority for us if we're capable of expanding the map now this bulge that we have poking out here this is incredibly huge it's not even really fair to call it a bulge because of the size of it Rumberg. they have the tranquil sea they don't seem to have cities, major cities. No, we just can't see what their cities are yet. So we need to invest in intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance technologies and spying and intelligence networks to be able to derive what info we can from them. And Agnolia is not a threat to us. There's only like pre There must have previously been a battle in order for this very odd sector to have been signed onto unless there's like a strong ethnic pocket here or something like that Stahl Bay, Gelb Islands and they're likely to be much more preoccupied with Valgusand. So what do we do about the fact that we have very little strategic depth against any of the two major threats Lesbia and Rumberg. Well, we what we do is we divide our forces into Army Group South, who has an area of responsibility, and the AOR will be keeping reconnaissance on this border all of the time, and they're going to need to be competent at manoeuvre warfare in order to be able to push or resist against any pocket that comes along this region here. And then Army Group North it's going to have the same role against this massive thousand kilometer long border all along here which is a big ask but that's necessary so hopefully we'll get some elite rangers or something like that or the other thing that we could really do for us some mm. pardon me some uh, spy planes just even some little sop with camels with pairs of binoculars on them in order to spot major troop movements would be enough However, diplomatically speaking, if we can form peace treaties with both of our major neighbours, that would be ideal. And then 
we'll, that will take us to the next chapter and we'll be able to move from there into a situation which frees us up to give us uh, greater autonomy. All right. Is there anything else that we need to say about the geopolitical situation that we're in? Yes. We don't have any information about what mountain ranges are here. And they are major strategic features. And so if we get information about those, that will completely alter our decision making. Suppose this river is at the base of a mountain range and the mountain range is on our side then that basically makes a massive defensive barrier that Lesbia would be foolish to ever push against. So we can deprioritize it as a defensive zone. <clears throat> uh, what else? River systems. So I've talked about the defensive uh, river systems, which are very good. But the other major factor, which fans of Peter Zion will recognize, is that um, the cheapest way to ship goods is on water. So if these are trade navigable rivers, which I'm going to assume if they're marked on the map that they're trade navigable, uh, then they, our layout is excellent. We, our coastal cities, obviously they're all going to have ports so we can ship from them uh, at the cheapest. That's great. Laren will be able to shift goods from their industrial centres down to Estord for increased value and then from there down to La Haven for again increased shipping, uh, increased efficiency in shipping. Narble uh, does not, so they're going to have to rely on these roads, so they're going to be significant, significantly less efficient. That probably explains why they're a smaller city than all of the other ones. Um, this is great, this is all connected, that's fantastic. This one is not. Uh, perfectly connected but you can see they've got a road going to Arnott so this is probably a shipping area that starts here or maybe there's one here and depending on what our relationship with Lesbia is like if we have a trade agreement we can probably ship down from here and Verloa Bay hopefully that opens out into the open ocean uh, what else this river goes all the way down to the ocean which is good it's still a long way it might be more efficient just to ship from to here and then take it out that way but whatever we'll leave that up to the free market to decide the individual industrialists can make up their own mind what's most efficient for them here we see the classic failing of the centrally uh, central uh, command and control economies we could easily just make a policy that says sana ships to the west and their ships to the north but of course that is all that's going to do is just mean that there's like a certain percentage drop in efficiency because these people are not able to um, respond to the economic incentives. The downside here is that traveling along a coastal defensive river means that it is a deniable. So at any point, Lesbia can say, uh, we're going to cut that off. Now, you might say to yourself, oh, well, that's only going to happen in wartime and we can just make a peace treaty and then we'll never have to deal with that. That's... Uh, true up to a point however from a strategic mindset perspective if we have goods going up and down this river the capacity for them to be able to cut off means to be cut off means that Lesbia can use that as leverage against us even if it's never openly stated inside the negotiations because diplomacy is always a matter of sustained hypocrisy uh, we will never be in a position of having an honest conversation about this going on. Instead, we just have to accept the fact that every negotiation that we have in this zone, in the background, is going to be uh, Lesbia saying, we can cut off the economic export economic activity of Sana anytime we want. Uh, so let's say that's 25,000 Soderland rubles. Well, that's a incentive that doesn't need to be stated which is going to weigh on our mind every time we have to make that decision uh what else infrastructure wise we look pretty well laid out there's lots of roads and the interconnection of our railways uh, connect our major nodes it'd be nice to expand those to the minor nodes when, if possible as well and we have docks i assume 
Anchors mean docks. No, it must be docks and all of the rest of these towns as well. All right, enough rambling about geostrategy. Let's go over the interface and see what information we can glean before moving on. Mm. Economy, our economic development, three bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three out of ten. So I guess that puts us in a lower second world, high third world zone. So probably lacking economic development everywhere outside of the major centres. Not great, but considering it's 1929, uh, also not too bad. Budget three, wealth three, oh, personal wealth, and government budget. Cool, I don't care about personal wealth, except so long as we can do what is necessary. Power is always more important than money, because power can always get money, but money can't always get power. And the government budget is three. This must be maximised. That would be very good. Alright. Uh, what else have we got? Chapter one. There's a portrait of me. Handsome fellow. Country overview. Political overview. Notes. And these are codex and journal. Let's have a quick look at the journal. Nothing doing. Codex. Oh, wow. That's, we're not going to read all of that. Forget about that. Alright. So this is where the information is going to be. Notes, political overview, country overview. All right, let's dig into what we can find about the country in order to make uh, clever decisions in the future. <whistles> Heavy duty. Well, I suppose if you're watching this video, you don't mind listening to me ramble. So let's dig deep on all of this stuff, shall we? I should probably split this into two separate videos, but I'm not going to. Okay, law, active policy, BFP banned, uh, okay, some secessionists, good, we do, should ban secessionists, obviously you're not allowed to uh, be for secession, that's a thing that is against the state, so the state will always move against secessionists, you know, unless you can make them more trouble than they're worth, but in that case you're asking for civil war. Uh, the president may veto bills. According to Article 77 and 82 of the new constitution, the president may veto a bill by returning it to the assembly with a written statement. Fantastic. So this is, uh, just gives us the ability to say no to the Duma whenever we want to. That's a fantastic uh, centralization power. Not fantastic for the country, obviously, but fantastic for the leader. Uh, president impeachable by the court. Great. We are basically an autocrat at that point then. Uh, ministers chosen from the assembly. The president appoints the ministers to the council of ministers from elected members of the assembly. So we get to our pick. So they pick the group first. And then we pick from the ones that they give us. That's not ideal. What we would really like to be able to do is just have a free choice. Or even better, have us pick the first round and have them pick the second round. Uh, and that way we can just give them all of the options that we like and then they can, you know, pick the least bad out of the options from their point of view. Uh, according to Article 50 of the new constitution, a political party needs a minimum of 10% of the total national vote to win seats in the Grand National Assembly. The votes of the parties who pass the threshold are represented proportionally. That's good. That's going to keep them all the scum out and basically enforces a two-party system, which suits us just fine. Because of our centralised power, we should be able to kneecap the second party. However, we don't want to kneecap them too bad. We want to attract all of the dissidents to be hopeful, to believe that the second-rate party is, cap is potentially capable of winning in the elections because that will keep them invested inside the democratic system. Presidential decrees. According to Article 18 and 51, the president may issue decrees on political, social and economic issues that would carry the force of law. Well, fantastic. Why don't they just call us king then? 
However, they could not contradict the Constitution and are subject to judicial review. The Assembly may pass legislation on the same subjects to override presidential decrees. Ah, right. I see. So we have three limits on our power. The Constitution, the Judiciary, and the Senate? No, the Assembly. Hmm. If we could get a Senatorial Assembly, something like the House of Lords, to sit over the lower house, the House of Commons, or the, uh, not consulate, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, anyway, the lower house, that would be good, just because then we could get them to info against each other. Uh, unlimited terms, fantastic. The justices of the Supreme Court are not responsible for the actions performed in the exercise of their duties. So oh, nice for them. Honorary membership gives immunity. Article 99 of the new constitution defines the member of honor title, its appointment procedures, as well as their rights may mem as well as their <coughs> excuse me. I can talk, I promise. As well as their rights, their members may exercise. A member of honor has absolute immunity and is a permanent member of the Grand National Assembly. He or she is entitled to his or her security team, provided by the state's presidential guards, blah, blah, blah. The only member of honor is Tarquin Sol. Okay. So, that means that we can't indict the former leader. I imagine that this uh, amendment to the Constitution uh, came about as part of the agreement for the peaceful transfer of power. That's alright, we are not a revanchist uh, authoritarian, we're not interested in punishing previous leaders, we're only interesting in, interested in instituting the policies that we're looking for. Constitution amendments require Assembly and Supreme Court with a two-thirds majority yeah okay that's fine all right current situations there is a court backlog well you know we should deal with that at some point limited women's rights well we'll need to talk to the marketing department and figure out which way uh, women vote generally speaking if the women in this nation match the general voting trends of uh, women in other nations then very likely they will vote for uh, a more liberal member of parliament than us which uh, reminds me we have to check to see whether the secondary party uh, is a more nationalistic or more authoritarian party than ours or a more liberal uh, uh, party than ours i suspect they're more liberal that's how these things tend to fall out if that's the case uh, remedying um, the problem with women's rights is only a moral issue, not a political issue for us. The Bludish problem. Now remember the Bludish are some of the uh, immigrants to our nation who were allowed in on the basis of potential uh, economic benefits because remember the free market argument for open borders is that the free movement of peoples means that there is greater populations for selection of people to roles. So employers have a greater choice of skilled talent to appoint to the roles that they need them to. Uh, very often immigrant populations uh, end up costing more money or at least neutralizing the potential economic benefits that come about. So um, we'll have to look into that before we make any decisions about that. Judicial rivalry. I assume that that means that the court is split between people that are on the court. Now, whether that's a problem for us or not is entirely dependent on whether the judiciary is in fact truly independent or whether they have, uh, whether they're politically indebted to us. So we'll come around to that problem later. Some human rights. Well, that's good. I'm glad we have some human rights. And freedom of the press. Great. We want freedom of the press. Uh, you know. As long as it doesn't become a problem for us, in which case maybe we'll turn against it. But outside of conditions of you know, warfare or if it becomes necessary for, for us to uh, make some compromising and ungentlemanly decisions for the benefit of the state, uh, then this should be fine. All right, what has the economy tab got for us? Alphonsonomics, that will have been the 
uh, poorly implemented, I assume, free market reforms introduced by the previous leader. Swordland's economy is being based on a planned doctrine. Ah, I take it back. Who was the previous leader? His name was... Tarquin? Was that right? Ugh, I'm losing track of the personalities. Anyway, ignore what I said about the free market forms. Uh, reforms. Swordland's economy has been based on a planned doctrine since its formation until the former president, Evald Alfonso, enacted free market reforms. Now the country finds itself between two different economic systems. Right. Evald Alfonso. Alright, current situations. Weak transportation links. Obviously that has to be dealt with. That's a major limitation on our economy, and also could have impact, major impacts in the case of us uh, getting invaded. Unemployment crisis, okay, we can solve that. Tax evasion, now this is a problem. We're gonna crack down on whoever this is. We're gonna find the industrialists and say to them, uh, the free market reforms are gonna make you huge quantities of money. However, in order for that to happen, we're gonna make it that you cannot evade your taxes anymore. And if we find out that you are, we're going to kneecap you. Metaphorically, of course. Decreased trade volume. Hmm. That's dissatisfying. If we, once we fix the transportation problems, our, increased, our trade volume may increase. If it's a problem of uh, internal economics. If it's a problem of external economics, then maybe some trade treaties will be able to increase our trade volume. What we really want to have is a positive uh, trade index, so we're selling more than we're buying from overseas. If that happens, we should be able to ramp this up great uh, in a really good way. In fact, even what we might end up doing is holding down, if possible, the exchange value of our currency in order to maximise the amount of uh, trade uh, volume that we send out and make other countries dependent on our industry. Not pointing any fingers, Germany, just saying. Bergia economic economy plummeting. Now is Bergia one of our little uh, states? No. No, this one here. Okay. Not sure why that would be happening. We should be able to fix that, I think. Lauren has a rust belt. Where is that? Well, that's no good. But we should be able to fix that. It's close to the capital, and uh, they have two ports. And they have some infrastructure, all three varieties operating here. So reinvestment in this economy uh, should uh, bring that about. One of our major priorities is going to be lowering the minimum wage in order to um, force people back into work. Uh, because that will make jobs more plentiful as uh, employers take on more employment. Obviously that's not necessarily going to be good for the people in the short term, uh, but in the long term it will work out, especially if uh, those profits that are made uh, by the industrialists turn into reinvestments, which I think we can achieve. Right. Uh, Argenland lacks investment. Okay, again, it's going to start getting expensive to try and uh, get the economy started again. But if we spend all of the profits that we make back on reinvestment, even though we won't be making any money year over year, theoretically we should be able to increase our total GDP. Stagnated production. Again, same problem, same solution. Okay, great. Here's the big one. What's going on with the military? Gendarmerie under defence. The Gendarmerie is an armed law enforcement organisation which maintains security and public order. Good. It primarily focuses on rural security but can be deployed to assist cities by mayors. Fantastic. We need to make sure that they have everything that they need. Swordish General Staff. The Swordish General Staff is a military planning body compromised of the top generals. Fantastic. We're definitely going to call a national security meeting. Uh, that's probably the first thing that we're going to be doing. First we'll call the military. Then we'll call the economy. 
and then maybe we'll call diplomacy depending on how these other things are going. Compulsory military service, fantastic. The military is a conscripted force, males serve in the military upon reaching the age of 18, that's really good. One of the things that we're going to need to do is uh, make sure that our immigrant populations are not evading this responsibility. We want to make sure that they get indoctrinated uh, into the uh, military culture of our uh, state. Okay, military inf interference in politics. So one of the this is a major issue. We absolutely need to make sure that there is civilian oversight of the military not the other way around. Of course the way that things work in coups is that whoever the military backs is uh, the winner in the coup, so we need to make sure that the military is on our side, but also we need to make sure that uh, the military is following our orders and that they understand that we are the head of the, the civilian oversight committee of uh, military decision making. So that means that we need to subordinate the military's uh, selfish interests to the foreign policy goals of the state. Uh, obviously that's a delicate balance. We see here we've got experienced generals, so I think we can assume that the generals in command of our military forces understand the deal. We have outdated military equipment, which is a problem, depending on uh, how big the uh, army is. If our armed forces are large we might be able to get away with not having to do a military upgrade yet. I, the ideal situation would be to have a military offset strategy where we can just be sure that we have greater technology than our opponents and it's every place where we engage them and if that's the case we can be fairly certain if we have both mass and uh, uh, offset, a technological offset that will be winning our engagement. However, a low technology but high scale military can be an effective def uh, uh, defensive force and therefore can dissuade evasions, uh, invasions. Uh, so this may or may not end up being a priority for us depending on what's happening with the diplomatic situation and all of that kind of thing. Uh, internal security jurisdiction. All right, don't know what that means but we're going to have to resolve that obviously. Large reservist pool, excellent. This is really good. Due, probably due to our compulsory military service we have a large number of reserves so that's fantastic that means that in the case of a national emergency like an invasion from the south we'll just call up everybody throw whatever weapons we can into them and if we have to do the Russian uh, strategy that's what we'll do All right welfare and we're gonna go quite quick with this one freedom in the curriculum good Voluntary vaccination, yep, that's fine. Welfare principles. The revolutionary welfare principles which laid out that the state should give welfare services to the Renan aristocracy are uh, being questioned. All right, so here, if the aristocracy is the major source of the officer class of our military, then we might come down on the side of maintaining those welfare principles. Uh, if not, well, maybe we can save ourselves the money. Overbell overburdened welfare system. This sucks, but this will be a problem once we get everybody back to work. Low quality rural health care. Okay, again, this is a problem. We want people to be healthy, but how much of a priority is it? Uh, if, our, if we have a high population growth rate, uh, I hate to be callous, but this is less of an issue in terms of strength of the uh, national state. However, we can also win the population's loyalty by going with this. And it depends a lot on how expensive it is. If we can make large gains at low costs, we'll do it. If it's going to be high costs for small gains, we'll flag it. Inaccessible rural education. Okay, that's a problem. You know, we'd like them to have higher education, but at this point, if it's, uh, they probably can run an uh, agricultural economy, in which case that's fine. Inconsistent curriculum. Don't really care about that. 
uh, solaced education. Don't know what that is. Good urban institutions. Well, that's a turn up. All right, what's going on with order? State security privileges. Members of the security apparatus in Swordland enjoy excessive privileges in society. Now, this could turn into a real issue. Obviously, we don't want abuses of power, but on the other hand, if we try to crack down on the security state using the security state, we could have some very negative repercussions coming out of that. So, corruption. This is a real problem. We definitely want to get rid of the corruption. Illegal immigration. Uh, whether this is bad or not depends on the internal growth rate in the economy. My guess is this is we're probably going to try and dissuade uh, illegal immigration, but not so much that it gets cut off entirely. Organised crime. Uh, this may be a problem or may not be a problem. We might allow a certain amount of organised crime, assuming that we can bring them into heel. Right? If we can get them to behave in the way that we want to, then they just become a deniable black operations scheme for us, in which case we might turn a blind eye, assuming that they're not doing anything which harms the population too much. On the other hand, uh, if neither of those things are possible, or they insist on harming the population in ways that are contradictory to the national interest, uh, we might have to just crush them. Uh, if that is the case, if we do want to crush uh, the organised crime syndicates, then we won't be uh, taking away privileges from the security apparatus, or at least not until this job has been done. Uh, also, we need to make sure we have to figure out whether the corruption is coming from the security state, or whether it's an external influence that's coming into the security state. All right, diplomacy. This is the big one. What's going on with our foreign policy? Neutrality. Okay, so that's a fair enough. I mean, this is really a, just a game decision more than anything else. Generally speaking, neutrality is not something that is available to states instead, unless you happen to be like Switzerland and, you know, just happen to have a geopolitical situation that favours it. Uh, so, yeah, this is just a straight up starting point. This won't stay. We will align with someone. OMEC member. The organization of Merkapin Economic Cooperation stimulates economic progress and increases continental trade. Fantastic. That is very good. We are definitely going to try and uh, fire up this organization if we can make it work for us. Uh, I'm assuming that if their remit is stimulating progress and increasing trade, they're not that our uh, political opponents won't be trying to use uh, OMEC as a way to uh, damage our economy. Instead, they're going to be trying to look for win-win diplomatic solutions and economic solutions. And if that's the case, it could be worthwhile. Uh, even if we end up in a situation where other countries are making more money than the amount of money that we're making, by which I mean they're seeing greater benefits than we're seeing from OMEC, uh, nevertheless, it still might be worthwhile for us because of all of the economic problems that we're seeing in the economy here, all of which require investment. Then once our economy gets up and running, if we can fix all of these problems, then we might uh, um, pull back a little on the uh, international free trade, depending on what the situation is and depending on who we align with and that kind of thing. Uh, there's another thing I was going to say about it. If we can create more free trade agreements than our opponents, such that we have a higher volume of trade than anybody else, international trade, then we're definitely going to double down on uh, OMEC membership. All right, and we're a member of the AN. The Alliance of Nations is a global organization that maintains peace, security, and cooperation among nations. Well, this is obviously based on the United Nations, and if that's the case, uh, very likely. They're going to have all of the political impact of somebody dropping a sponge cake from six foot. Now, what have we got? Rumberg expansionism. That's a real problem. Where is Rumberg? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, this could turn into a real issue. So, we're definitely going to need some military stations in these two major cities. And this is good that we have a road here for manoeuvre. Uh, lack of allies, this is a problem, but not something that can't be overcome. We just need to have some diplomatic agreements and you know, figure out what the 
situation is. Influential OMEC member? That is great. Many economic experts of the founding OMEC members were of sort. Oh, we can click on these to figure out what they say. Oh, I should have been doing that at the beginning. I oh, would have taken way longer though, so maybe you're glad I didn't. Many economic experts of the founding OMEC members were of sortish descent, thus Swordland is a key member. Fantastic. In that case, we're going to put it to use. And we have experienced diplomats. That is great. All right, so if Rumberg is an expansionist state, and at the moment we haven't had any reason to suspect that Lesbia is going to move against us, we will attempt to diplomatically ally with Lesbia. And then if we do that, assuming that we see you know, fairly friendly um, withdrawal of forces from the border regions, we will match their withdrawal factor such that there's a balance of power on this border and any extraneous forces that we have will get pushed up to here. Uh, the other thing we can do is hopefully incentivize our reserves to seek employment in this region. That would be very good. Great. All right, so that covers all of these things. Expansionist doctrine from Berg in the last century has caused a highly volatile situation on the Merkhofer continent. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So we're almost done with this video. We're just going to look at the political overview and see what's going on here. Okay, maybe it won't be a short time. Hmm. What a fantastic coat of arms. The goat rampant with six crowns uh, with the uh, on a shield with the wreath of victory. Uh, all right, what's who's our cabinet? That's our mate Peter. Whew. I'm going to read all that. Then we have chief strategist Lucian Gallard. And then these are all of our ministers. Good. Minister of Defence and Security. Uh, you're going to be a high priority to talk to. Justice and Law, Economy, Simon Hall. He is going to come on. Education, Technology and Research. Foreign Affairs and Trade. Now, this guy here. David Wishy. Vishy. You are going to be a major person. You can probably just do what you think is best. Pascal Benevol, Health, Social Affairs and Labour. Yeah, we're going to probably going to underfund your department, so you're just going to do the best you can, mate. Factions. Ah, oh, now this is likely to be a real balancing act. Old Guard. The Old Guard are the Solists from the old administration who defend the status quo and promote conservative politics. Some claim that they've established a deep state that controls the state operator. apparatus. Apparatus? Apparatus. Key figure, also Hawker. Orso is the leader of the Supreme Court and has established links with many in the administration. That's good. We need a strong uh, backbone inside the country because we came to power on a uh, platform that had uh, certain nationalist elements to it. So we definitely want this. This is a good thing. So we're going to make sure that the old guard... Uh, maintain some of their political power. We're, we're certainly not going to allow also Hawker to be ousted from his position on the Supreme Court. Uh, and presumably he's going to be already operating to bring up an heir uh, to replace him once he retires. It looks like he's getting on a bit. All right. Oligarchs are the powerful elite who control the majority of the wealth in Swordland. Their influence both in and out of Swordland have been growing due to the privatisation efforts in the past. Well, likely they're going to favour us if we increase our privatisation and free market reforms. However, they'll own, they won't get any loyalty for us. Walter is a spokesperson of the Lotherberg Group which controls a huge part of the economy. So we're going to need to get them on site, and we have something that we can give them, so hopefully we can bring them in. Uh, they're not going to like our tax reforms, but they're just going to have to put up with it. Reformists. The reformists are the representatives in the government united under the call for the dip, uh, democratic reforms. Over the years, they have been gaining popularity since the failed rule of the previous government. Fins Richter. Friends is the leader of the PFJP and slowly becoming the face of a major united opposition. So presumably the reformists are our opposing political party. That's fine, we do need one of those. We just need to make sure that they never come to prominence. 
So if we can keep the old guard and the oligarchs on side, that's going to match two out of three of the uh, factions. And between the combination of the state under our leadership, the old guard and the oligarchs, we should be able to keep the reformists in check just fine. Now remember that the least stable form of uh, political alignments is three, because any alliance turns into a two versus one fight. So I think that this looks pretty good for us overall. Legislative. We have 130 seats, PFJP has 70, and the NFP has 40. This is an excellent situation for us. In terms of diplomatic policy, uh, in terms of uh, democratic domestic policy, we, what we want to do is try and push as many members of the PFJP into the NFP as possible uh, to, and breed an intersonine war between the two parties such that they're incapable of cooperating. If we can manage that, that's fantastic, that's high priority for us. And also want to balance their numbers such that um, it becomes really difficult for either of them to um, come to the lead. We're not going to be so keen on that that we're going to give away our seats to the NFP. However, if we can balance the fight between these two, that would be great. Uh, what we don't want to do is get into conflicts with them for ourselves, if at all possible. If these are, part of, if these two parties, the PFJP and the NFP, are closer to each other than they are to us, then we need to try and get into a situation where they're splitting hairs with each other and minor uh, confrontations over uh, policy divisions blow up into personal conflicts and if that happens we should be able to keep them occupied with each other. If they are on opposite sides of us, such that for example the PFJP is on the left of us and the NFP is on the right of us, left and right being diff you know, bunk terms but nevertheless you see my point, if that happens then we can operate as the centre of gravity and just move where we are always towards the centre of whatever the majority votes for. Uh, and that should keep both of the other two on the outside because the strategic necessity for them to oppose us means that if we can snab that central position where the majority of voters uh, voting for, um, they will by, nece by necessity be on the outside. So that's great. Uh, all right, Speaker of the Grand National Assembly, that's fine. Uh, leaders of the Assembly. Leader of the Opposition, Franz Richter. Fantastic. So this is who our domestic policy is going to be focused against. Kazaro Kibana, Chairman of the NFP and then Leader of the Independents. All right, we're just going to have a quick look at these guys. Politician, businessman, Leader of the Freedom and Justice Party, uh, Human Rights, um, Industrial Companies. He helped open research and development departments. Oh, look at this. Blah, 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 blah. We do not care. Leader of the National Front Party. All oh, right, so this is the guy who's on the far right. Yeah, so we're in between these two. So that cements our manoeuvre strategy. All right, what's happening in the judiciary? Yep, go away, Kazaro. So this fellow here, we want him on side. Justice is a centrist. That's perfect because we're going to be operating in the terms of the centre. That's our domestic manoeuvre policy, and we have Nia Mordgna, Minister of Justice and Law, also a member of the court. Hmm, what is she? A reformist. So there are three reformists, if we have a look here, those are the people that we're operating against. One, two, three, four, five. Five old guards, we're going to try and keep them on site. Or in fact, we're going to do absolutely anything we can to keep them on side, just about. Then we have the centrists. Uh, we're going to hope that they stick with us, seeing as we're going to be manoeuvring towards central policy, and that will keep the uh, reformists and the uh, rightists off. Notice how the far right... Mm, I was going to say they don't have any seats, but actually now I think about it, probably quite a number of the old guard party uh, is actually... Uh, voters of the NFP, that's entirely possible. However, the NFP has less votes than the PFJP, so at the moment we'll probably lean towards more liberal policies, liberal centrist policies. 
in order to snatch seats off the PFJP. That's going to cause a problem because here uh, we might lose one of the justices. But if that happens, if we there, um, if we lose their loyalty, we've still got one to lose. So we're still going to have a severe lead, and that will keep the three justices on side with us, hopefully, meaning that we should still have a strong hand over the judiciary. And Nia Morgner um, will also be pleased by that, but there's no way that we're going to be able to win the libs over to our size, uh, over to our side. That's fine though. All right. Theoretically, I could do the news as well, but I'm going to leave that to the next video. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that background breakdown, and I'll see you next time.